the, the gas stations that you guys all fill your cars up with, you know, how do those companies make money? Um, so it's been, it's been uh, interesting to learn all that stuff. And I know, Virginia, you've had some different clients outside of the energy industry, right? Yeah, I've had, um, I've done healthcare, and I was on one small shipping certification client. Um, I've done specifically like trading and in oil and gas I've mostly focused on derivatives so I'm still in learning actual oil and gas accounting because I have not gotten that overall picture yet. Um, Jack. Yeah, and yeah, so I'm Jack. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've actually, it's interesting living in Houston and not working in oil and gas because that's the majority of the market, but I've been working in entertainment um, for Live Nation um, which is ticketing sales, you know, sponsorships with artists. Um, who's, who's heard of Live Nation? Raise your hand. I'm sure they send you emails all the time. Yeah, yeah, like 80%. Um, it's Jack spamming you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's me. <laughs> no, but I spent about 90% of my year out there, and I, I really have enjoyed it uh, so far. And uh, so, if you know, if you end up, you know, ever going to Houston, it's, you know, that being said, you don't have to do oil and gas. There are other things to do. Yeah, I can quick show of hands. Who... Raise your hand if you're a junior. Okay, seniors. Do you want sophomore, freshman? Okay, who's audit? Who likes tax? Okay, so yeah, it's a pretty good split. Like Phil said, like these puzzles, a lot of them are more so like soft skills, so it's not specific to just audit. So don't want the tax people to feel not included in this. And um, but we'll talk through this. And like he said, it's, it's a lot of it is audit pertained, but. Again, it's big picture and um, more just soft skills. So yeah, and to put it in the light for you guys, you've all been through intermediate class, right? So you know all the different accounts on a balance sheet or on your income statement and stuff like that. Um, what this presentation focuses on is, you know, outside of just doing your debits and credits for businesses. Once you guys get into grad school, you'll have classes with like Dr. Cantrell where. You're working on, um, you know, basically understanding how businesses work outside of just, a, hey, I need to book an entry for revenue here and an expense entry for, because ultimately when you're going through public accounting, you don't stay in public accounting to go leave and, and enter a bunch of journal entries for a small mom and pop company. You know, you're going to be future leaders of these Fortune 500 companies, and so working on these types of skills. Um, is kind of like you're doing it now. You know, you guys are obtaining right now the technical development and certification. Once you get your CPA, at that point in time, you just start building experience. And every single year, you can kind of look back, and I've been there for three years now, and you can say, wow, like I learned significantly a lot more information about my job and just business in general versus, you know, myself a year ago. So it's crazy to see that as you look back and see how your career has developed. So let's see. So you can kind of read through this. It's basically the core idea behind this natural born solvers um, presentation. It's, we've done this at other schools too, and it's it's kind of unique to see how people work with others in, in putting together these, these brain teasers or riddles, whatever you want to call them. Um, but it's in short, it's how does, how does your skills working through these problems relate to when you're in the work, working world and you say, hey, you know, an issue came up, I gotta go work with my manager or my senior manager or my partner or, or human resources or legal, um, you know, like a bunch of lawyers. That, that comes up through like your normal working life and so it's working through those problems and your ability to come up with a solution is kind of what this focuses on. So here's the rules and Chelsea, you can probably explain a little bit better. Yeah, we can kind of tweak these a little bit. So basically we're going to give you all in your team, everyone has a team, right? Are you, are you good? Are you good? Yeah, I think I'm good. Okay, good. You fly solo too. Are you good? Do you have a team? Find it, just join someone in front of you, behind you, whatever. Or just move um, around. Sure, yeah. And we're going to do the honor system in terms of points. Um, we're ethical at EY, so we're going to test you and see if Am you I are too. Good? No, they're going to, like I said, they're going to. Honor system. Them. Yeah, oh. they're going to explore themselves. So. Um, okay, so we're going to give you three minutes. Most of you will get the puzzles, the answers before the three minutes, but if not, we'll wait it out if we need to. Um, the first team to finish, raise your hand when you think you have the right answer, and let's have everyone on the team, like, I don't know if y'all were at Jeopardy last year when we came to do the presentation, but um, the buzzer was everyone on the team raising their hand, and then we'll come up and check your answer. Um, and if you are that team, you're going to get two 
two points. If you answer the correct, the, you have the correct answer, you'll get one point regardless of when you finish. And then if you can't solve the puzzle at all, zero. Um, and then the team at the end with the uh, most points will win and you can take home all the leftover pizza. So, um, are y'all good on understanding how to, yeah, um, good on how to score? Good, yes, are y'all awake? Okay, perfect. Yeah, the more interactive this is, the more fun it will be. Just don't shout out the answer. If somebody gets it, don't just shout yeah. out because the team in the back might be working on it too. And yeah, have your team just, you just raise your hand. So we're going on the, the buzzer too. Okay. The three, the three kind of topics that they focus on here that relate to the business world is one, dealing with incomplete data. So that'll be kind of the first puzzle as it relates to you're having, you don't have all the information present to come up with the answer, so you got to kind of figure it out. Two is le leveraging different perspectives, so based off the way people think, um, and when we go through these puzzle puzzles, you'll see with people you're working with, um, you know, your mind just kind of goes in different directions, one person versus another. No, no two people are going to say the exact same thought process of how they came up to the conclusion, um, but ultimately there is one answer. So. And then the ability to see the big picture is, that's kind of what I was relating to earlier, rather than just say, hey, you know, I'm an accountant, I'm looking at revenue, and this is how you book a revenue entry during the sale. Like, there's just so many things when you go through your career that are going to make you great business professionals, and so leveraging everything that you utilize in your day-to-day, -day, um, you know, career and development and mentoring, it kind of puts together the big picture for the business world for you guys. So, I think, so the first same thing with analytics, same thing, just being business savvy. Yeah, so this one is the first dealing with incomplete data. So if y'all are ready, we can start, I'll start the time here. All right, and don't yell the answer. <laughs> don't feel bad if you can't get the answer, because right. honestly, I would solve these. All right, y'all ready? All right, so ready, go. All right, so dealing with incomplete data, what number should appear in this last egg? So you're trying to come up with a solution for this guy right here. And you're trying to start it. Good luck. <laughs> you don't you don't need a pen and paper for this, but it might be helpful. I think it's helpful. These guys are all smart, yeah. Okay. Okay. You can talk out loud during this. We're not playing the same game. <laughs> I did that for a year. <laughs> 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 
All right, is that time? <laughs> we already have a first and a second. <laughs> They got it first. Don't mean to call you out, but who did it, did it. <laughs> That's okay. All right, so our first place winners are going to explain how they got their answer. The answer's three. Yeah. All right. Um, so y'all said fractions. Like, I just like, But you got it before that. I just so. did division. Yeah, yeah okay, same so thing. 18 divided by 9 is 2. Yep. 9 divided by 9 is 1. 2 divided by 1 is 2. Yep. 24 divided by 2 is 12, 36 divided by 6 is 6, 12 divided by 6 is 2, so 30 <laughs> divided by 5 is 6, 4 divided by 2 is 2, 6 divided by 2 is 3. Yep, that's right. <laughs> what? That's so that's why I gave the whole time. In short, you're going to take these numbers and you divide them, and that's 6, and then you take these and you divide them, and that's 2, and so then 6 divided by 2 is 3. And so. So, kind of on this. You guys have dealt with this in all your classes, and us in the working world, we deal with this literally all the time, working with clients and trying to obtain an understanding of like a certain part of the business um, as it relates to you know our jobs, our day to day jobs. So, I mean, who's got a talk about it? Who has a an example, or maybe? We could just all talk out loud. Is when you work through like a, a project or something, or let's let's for an example, if you got an intermediate problem and you know that you need A, B, C, and D to solve the problem, but if if the problem only gives you like A, B, and C, and you don't have D, you would kind of be like, okay, I'm never going to be able to get the right answer here without those variables. Does that make sense? So that that stuff comes up all the time in our job, where you go and you work with a client, right? And, I did this the other day, I was trying to basically obtain an understanding for ARO, which, let's, who, who knows what ARO stands for? Probably nobody. It's an oil and gas type term for asset retirement obligation. Essentially, this is just kind of so big picture world. You know, oil and gas companies, you go out into the ocean, or if you go out into Midland, Texas, or you know, up in like North Dakota, anywhere really, Canada, and you dig a huge hole into the ground to pull out oil and gas reserves that ultimately go into y'all's cars to drive you to class or the bar or whatever. Um, I shouldn't be driving to the bar. But anyway, those huge holes that cost you know multi-millions of dollars to drill into the ground, there's, there's regulations that you have to come back and um, essentially fill the ground back in the way it was before you started drilling for oil and gas reserves. And so I like had no idea about what all this was and I had to start asking the client and my managers for information of obtaining an understanding about how that process works. So it's, if I didn't have all the information for how they come up with these estimates that they're gonna be paying for 20 years down the road, there's no way that I can even begin to do my job to say, hey, yeah, they have $300 million on their balance sheet for this obligation that they're gonna pay in 30 years. And if that makes sense, that's kind of like what we're dealing with here. And working together in teams, I don't know if one person on y'all's team got it together or she got it, I can tell. She's pretty humble. But uh, if, you, if you were working together on another team, some, someone might be like, oh, you do the division, and then the other person might be like, well, you have, you have to do it for two times, and you'll see that in these other puzzles, how that relates. So any other inputs from that from you guys? Well, I think generally, you know, there's, in any situation, there's going to be some uncertainties. Um, and I think some of that comes with, you know, some trial and error. Um, and I think, you know, things like this, you know, really, they kind of show, you know, show that process. Uh, so finding the why. I think auditors are constantly trying to find, like, why something's missing. Um, how can you yeah. fill in the gaps? And then also, from more of a people perspective, um, incomplete data. You might not understand as a staff why you're being asked to do certain tasks. And at the end of the day, it's a it's a big picture, and that's one of the topics later. Um, but it's part of the team, and someone can't do your job until you, you know, it's a domino effect. It goes up the chain. So um, just kind of being okay with not having all the answers all the time is totally fine anyway, and asking questions is, is standard. Yeah, yeah. 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 So next puzzle. Okay. Ready? We'll start off. This 
this one's this one's another one, and it deals with uh, leveraging different perspectives. So to the point of earlier, this one's kind of like a process of elimination type exercise. But we'll give what three minutes again. Okay, this one's called Who Stole the King. Go. So during a recent police investigation, Chief Inspector Stone was interviewing five local villains to try to identify who stole Mrs. Archer's cake from the Midsummer Fair. Below is a summary of their statements. Arnold, Brian, Charles, Derek, they all have these statements saying who or who didn't do it. And then it was well known that each suspect told exactly one lie. So, you know, in Edward's statement right here, one of these is a lie and one of them's a truth. So you have to figure out who stole the cake based off of these this qualitative information. All right, I'll start the time now. Good luck, because I, I, I had trouble with this one. Paper is probably helpful on this one. One lie and one truth. Dr. Cantrell had it first, but I'll listen to you. Charles was Brian, so it's for sure one of them. But then if you yeah. look at what Brian said, it wasn't Charles, it wasn't Edward. 
one was telling the truth and one was a lie, so it has to be Charles. Yeah, that's and that's that's the textbook solution that it says in our packet, but the way you did it works as well. So it's I guess that feeds into what this is talking about, uh, le leveraging different perspectives because when you all are working in groups and everybody starts doing this this problem on their own first, right? And you kind of say, okay, I'm going to read through all these statements and you start coming up with tactics of how am I going to start figuring it out. To his point, once you read through the fourth line, you can say, okay, well, you know, here's here's the first piece of information that I need. It's one of these two, and then you start doing another process of elimination. How can I identify whether it's Brian or Charles? Um, you know, so you're you're leveraging different thought processes. That I mean, this was a great example that you guys both had different ways of going at it, and ultimately you got it first. So maybe your way was better. Um, All right, next next one. Other one? Everyone's answer is. <laughs> yeah. I'll usually get the right one in the end. Okay. Okay, so next one, go. Alright, leveraging the same topic, what is it that repeats once every minute, repeats twice every moment, but never in a hundred years? I feel like this is, seems to be an easy one. I'm not even going to start the time, but yes, we still have it. Yeah. Y'all are good. I didn't. It, I was started thinking about totally different stuff, like a clock. So maybe somebody come up with an example, and I'm sure you were given tasks, right? Or you were doing different team projects, working with a senior, working with some sort of manager, uh, you know, leveraging different perspectives. Or did you see any of your team members, you know? I, I recently was on a team, just kind of background for me, I started at UI, I worked for a team with about 20, 25 people year round for two years straight. And then I got put onto a smaller company that we had won from a competitor firm, I'll leave it at that, and, um, you know, I was with new people that I'd never worked with before, and I could utilize this because some of my old managers, you know, they're just super detail-oriented, or they set up work papers, and they did certain procedures in this way that I saw was, like, a really useful way of doing things, 
And then I got onto a new team with new managers and new people that were kind of coaching me throughout my career. And I picked up on new things that, you know, my other managers didn't do or didn't at least portray to me as well. And so you kind of start leveraging different development points throughout your career to help, you know, build your own skill set, really. So that's, that's kind of the big picture I am here. Yeah, and the, and the ability to adapt to different situations and scenarios, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Any examples from internships? People who just got back from that. <coughs> no? All right, Why? and we'll also say perspective for us. We, uh, we have a big push, and all big four really do, but on diversity and inclusiveness, and this is a big reason why is if we had the same person sitting in a conference room trying to figure out a solution, if we had five bills around a table, it's not going to probably be the best answer. It's going to be a great answer, but um, <laughs> when you have you bring in different people from different backgrounds who have different life experiences and um, different journeys, your answer is going to be ten times better than what you can come up with on your own and having someone who is the exact same thought process um, sitting next to you. So DNI for us is a Really important, so we can come up with the best solution. <coughs> All right. Anyone else? Um, we never really bridged the gap to audit on the cake one. Okay. On inquiries, so in audit, you normally have to perform procedures to obtain an understanding around different processes that the company does. So, like for example, revenue for an, or. Actually, let's do inventory for inventory when they buy the inventory, when they put on the books, all the way to when you see it on their financials. So you'll have to go through and inquire of a bunch of different people, kind of like how in that kick example, there were a bunch of different people that like had one truth and a lie. Well, that sometimes is how it is. People just say things that they don't mean because they get really nervous in front of auditors. So you kind of have to like actually do that in the field. You're like, well, this person said this, this person said this, but that, those things aren't the same. Um, so we actually have to do that a lot, but I think it becomes really helpful when we go to the non-accounting people. So the accounting people, sometimes they'll give us like just strict detail and like actual journal entries, whatever. But when we go to like the warehouse, those guys love to just talk about their job. Um, and they kind of give us a little bit more detail. So I think it's good to, you actually have to ask a bunch of different people what they do and kind of put all that together. And that's how we, we actually have to write documentation on all of these, like inventory for example, all of those steps of the inventory from when they buy it to when they put it in the financials. Um, do you have any examples? Yeah, no, I mean, I think just to kind of piggyback on that, it's. It's a little bit of, you know, um, when you ask a question, you know, they know you're looking for a specific answer sometimes, and sometimes they'll give you that answer. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's true or not is up to your, you know, judgment to decide, and, you know, I think that's important. <laughs> Any questions about that? Great. Um, yeah, Jessica. Who had to, uh, when you guys were on your internships, did anybody have to go ask questions of the client? Is anyone in that position? You did, you did. I remember I had to do that and I was kind of, I was nervous like the day before work where I knew I was going to have to do these procedures where like, what if this guy just grills me and, you know, ask me a question and I have no idea about it. But you do learn to adapt, like Jack said, and work on it. So give, give me an example of what you did. Um, well, I have to, for my first client, we worked in the client office. Yeah. So I would sometimes just have to go back and forth with some people. Asking for like certain documents. Follow up, like following yeah, up follow on, up hey, that's like missing information, right? So yeah. you just, you gave it to your senior or whoever, and you're trying to figure out what procedures to do, and you realize, well, we don't have any of this information, so yeah. they're sending you to, you know, go inquire of that person and figure it out. How about you in the back? What was, what was your example? Yeah. Uh, well, mine was specifically with the client. Um, they have like an AP audit board where they didn't pay faces in a certain number of days. He got down on the board and she was the manager for the board. And um, we spent about two hours going over the AP audit board about 15 different times. <laughs> Sounds <Hi>. brutal. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that, for sure. All right, we'll go cool. on to the next one. Cool. Let's do the next puzzle. Um, here we go. You guys can read through this on your own or Jack no, read it online. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, who are these guys? Uh, it's Related to the ability to see the big picture. 
I was at my home. Suddenly I started running. After a distance, I turned left. Later, I took a left turn again. After covering some distance, I took another left and reached my home. When I reached home, I saw two guys wearing masks. Who are these guys? Go. Yeah. You got it? Yeah, you got it. That's the first one. You got it first? Yeah. See, single team member right there. Yeah, I mean, you know, team on your back. Why don't you? you guys need to bring them in on your group presentations. Yeah, we'll link you in together. Yeah. Anybody yeah. else? You guys are the all star guys. Thought it was like burglars. 
Like they run, they commit a crime, they come back. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, what other guys wear masks? And you're thinking like a physical home versus home plate, and you're focusing yeah, on like right. he's going, that's the mask, and yeah. you got to be able to not focus on those little pieces that might be insignificant or significant pieces of the puzzle, and you know, want to see the big picture. So, what else? Yeah, it's easy to get caught up in the details, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's always helpful to take a step back and look at it from, you know, larger perspective. Yeah, and this also comes to play with your career progression. At EY, you're assigned a counselor and a peer advisor, and um, you might go to your counselor saying, I'm really having this issue, and um, you might need help taking a step back and looking at the situation differently, and that counselor is there to kind of guide you through seeing a different perspective and kind of talking you through, well, maybe you did this because of this, and you can try doing this differently next time you see this same situation. So um, it doesn't have to be you know, a problem. It can also be in terms of your career progression as well. So, any other examples you guys want to talk to? Um, I would say actual like ability to see the big picture when you're auditing financial statements. Um, one of the biggest things, or the hardest things for me to grasp was the materiality standpoint. So if you're looking at financial statements and you're looking at a specific account, you're looking at the detail of that account, and there's all these line items and you want to focus on one thing because you think it's a peculiar name or something which you can look into but at the end of the day we as auditors set a materiality and when we look at different like additions to accounts we actually we can waive on certain items if it isn't going to be material to the financial statements and you have to like if my seniors had to get me to take a step back and look at well would this item, even if the client did do this wrong, would this actually impact the financial statements? And most of the time, I was going way too into detail and the answer was no. Um, but again, as auditors, a lot of us do pay attention to detail a lot. That's why we're good at auditing. Um, but you really do have to take a step back and realize that that small, very small item is immaterial. The investors do not care about it at all. You have to take a step back and look at the big picture. It's just like taking an intermediate test, right? Where Dr. Shaw teaches you how to do a problem. And at the end of the day, if you're only a couple dollars off, I think you should be getting an A. You know, you shouldn't be marking the whole thing wrong and giving you no points. But it's, it's my perspective. And I mean, it's, you know, it's not a secret that, you know, it can, this job can be stressful. It's kind of the nature of auditing in general and, and tax as well. And like that. Um, so it's important when you get in these high stress situations to to really be able to take yourself out of it for a second, you know, prioritize what's really important versus, you know, what maybe is, is not something that you need to, you know, emphasize your focus on. It's all about identifying really what the risks are and something that I never knew going through school, um, specifically as it relates to audit, right? So you take a, a big company, let's say Apple, it's one of our clients, so I can use it. And Apple has a bunch of investors. Maybe you guys even spend some of your your money and you buy stock in Apple, right? And every single year, Apple comes out and says, hey, we made $20 billion this year and we're gonna be giving dividends to our shareholders and you know, anyone who has stock in our company made money this year because we did, um, you know, we were successful, we sold products and we made profit. So when you have auditors come in and say, you know, hey, you're looking at Apple, you know, did they really have $100 billion in revenue? Right? Might even more. I don't even know the number there. Big less. Um, but you're really saying, like, you know, is that is that information correct? So that if I'm a guy on the street and I go and buy stock in Apple, you know, are all of their presentations that they give to the public are those are those correct? Are those true? Is that information valid? Because otherwise, you'll have something going on like WorldCom or Enron or. I don't know if anyone, I was talking to students this weekend, it, I guess David Myers hasn't been back in a while to give his presentation. He was an Ole Miss alumni who ended up in jail for like 11 months for basically cooking the books at WorldCom. And it's, it's, people were buying stock in WorldCom at that point in time, right? And let's say you worked at WorldCom and you know, you're putting all of your, your savings into WorldCom because hey, I work for that company, they're doing really well, the return is high. 
So I'm going to be able to buy a house in 10 years because I'm putting all my money into there. And then this corporate fraud comes out that they've been cooking the books and overstating revenues and you know, they were technically making a loss when they were saying they were making a profit. And everyone who had been purchasing stock of WorldCom for X amount of years, you know, you look at your Fidelity account and it says $100,000 one day and then boom, this, this fraud comes out, you look at your Fidelity account and it's going to be like 15000 you lose so much money because all of those shares <laughs> combined. And that's that's why you diversify your portfolio, but that's that's a different class. You guys can learn about that later. Does that make sense though? Did you guys know that? I mean, I'm trying to think back when I was in school, how much do you really know about how audit impacts like the general business world? Does that make sense? You guys following that? Teachers, am I accurate back there? Good, thumbs up, means I'm, I'm on point. <laughs> All right, okay. so I think that's the end of the next week. Okay, so congrats, you won. Highlight your points, really keeping points at this point. I think they had two first places, so my maths aren't very good, but. Phil, Apple had $230 billion. $230 billion last year? Yeah, so I was way off. <laughs> that's crazy. I don't look it up, I didn't know that. Yeah, no, but I mean, what did Amazon have? Probably higher than that, right? I'd have to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> Siri knows. All right, so we have, I'm going to get called out of here at 7 is our role, but we did plan for Q&A. So if you want to ask us any type of question, it can be recruiting. I know some of you who are juniors might be going through that, or interviews, or and it doesn't matter what firm you're interested in, we are happy to answer any type of question you don't have. We're very honest, probably too honest at some point. But do um, you want to have anything to you got the best question. You can take the first one. A lot of people take home. So, yeah, that's it. Oh, what do you like about UI versus other firms? Yeah. Or why did you question. take UI going for recruiting? Did that help? Yeah. Is that a better okay. Yeah. Um, you guys want to chime in? <laughs> 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 so I, I interviewed the both before. I'm mostly with Texas, um, and each firm would send people from the different cities. Like I was doing Dallas and Houston, and when you progress through interview, the interview process, you get to actually do office visits normally. Um, and I realized that most of the people that, and this is still true for us, like most of the people that are doing recruiting, like all of us that are in audit, we're trying to find people that are actually on our team. We have people at all different campuses. Um, or like around the southwest region and southeast region. Um, what? The country. The country, yeah. really, yeah. Okay. Um, so the people that are like actually on campus doing recruiting were the ones that you're most likely going to be working with, or like some of our friends that if you want to be in a different industry. Um, so I kind of chose it based on the people that I thought I would work well with. I actually ended up working with some of their friends instead because um, I wanted to be in a different industry. But to me, I know everybody says this, but it was the people because I specifically like, really liked the people from EY Houston. And even with EY, like EY Dallas and EY Houston are gonna be totally different yeah. personalities. Yep. So that's something you gotta fill out too when you're going to these events and stuff. Yeah. Um, all have the basic you know, values that each firm carries, but <coughs> the offices definitely vary. That's, that's the biggest point right there is that, you know, if I was in your shoes and I met with EY at a bunch of different offices, you know, or if I was going through recruiting at a different office, if let's say I wanted to work in Dallas or go back to St. Louis where I'm from, it would be very different because I'm not going to say that EY would be the best firm, at least for me and the way I fit in, in that office. Uh, but I mean, it's all just about meeting the people that you're going to be working with. To Verge's point, that's, that's spot on because you guys are all going through, you either just got back from your internships, right, or you're planning to do an internship, or you're gonna make it through school and you're gonna get into the working world, and the, the crazy thing about public accounting is, you know, you're, you're not just going into the job your first day, and you're working under a manager that's 45 years old, no offense guys in the back, but um, you're not just working with older people all the time. I wish I was 45 years old. <laughs> You're working with you're working with people like for take me and Virginia are seniors and so when your first day on the job you would be a staff learning 
about, let's say, a company. If you're working on my oil and gas company, or if you're working on an Apple client or whatever, you know, your day-to-day -day procedures that you're working on and developing as a professional, you're going to be working underneath of someone like me, and I'm going to be the one who's teaching you things, right? Like outside of, hey, you went to training and you know the EY culture now, you know how to kind of use like our laptop and stuff like that. You know, you're starting off day one, and I actually work with Virginia now on a, on a newer client that we're taking public later. Um, it's, she makes fun of me because I go to the whiteboard a lot and like draw things out for younger staff because the oil and gas reserves aspect, like from Ole Miss, you just don't know that stuff. You don't know how the, uh, it's called geological and geophysical engineering aspect plays into basically the company recording all of their accounting functions, right? So I go to the board a lot and I, I show them like, hey, this is what a well looks like and this is where the, the oil and the gas comes from and you know, here's Shell, they're, they're purchasing it and then they're, you know, they're paying our, our client you know, $10 million at that point in time and then that's when basically it's off of our client's books and they don't deal with it anymore because they got their $10 million and they record all the expenses relating to taking that oil out of the ground. And so, I mean, when you're coaching others and you're working with others throughout your entire career, you want to be with people that you feel like are going to be putting you in the best position later in life, right? Everyone's goal when they come into the corporate world is to develop as a professional, be successful, you know, make money. And so when you're learning and kind of developing as an individual, you want to be working with people that you feel like are pushing you down the right path, if that makes sense. And so when I went through recruiting, that's the people that I met, the, you know, whether it was the staff that were coming for the recruiting trips or the managers, senior managers and partners, I felt most um, comfort with them being like, hey, I'm going to be on their accounts and they're going to actually help me become, you know, a successful business professional. So does that make sense? And yeah, well, same I, mean, with James for everyone. I think it's difficult to differentiate between, you know, some of these big four accounts sometimes <coughs> because, uh, you know, the work is, you know, similar um, in, in each firm, but uh, I think the important thing um, from, you know, going through recruiting was really uh, having a connection with someone, you know, like myself, Phil, Virginia, Chelsea, whatever it is. Um, and, and I think to Phil's point, to who, you know, uh, going to get you to where you want to be uh, professionally, um, and who's going to help facilitate that um, the most effectively. And I think that was what ultimately drove my decision. I would also say there might be some firms, you have to think, like these firms are bringing the best of the best to recruit you, and if you're not clicking with them, that might not be the firm with you, or for you. Um, but let's say like PwC and EY are tied, and you want to go to Atlanta, then maybe broaden your thought process a little bit more, and be like, okay, what clients do I want to be on? If you want to be on Coke, and um, some of our clients, and maybe EY is a good fit for you at that point. But it's, it's take it a step further, if people isn't making the decision for you, like do some research, look at the clients and the market share and all of that as well because that is going to be what you're working on and if, you know, that would be an important decision in your career progression as well. Yeah, I think clients is usually a pretty big driver as well. Um, I think UI typically does a pretty good job of maintaining and attaining new clients. Okay. And that's always kind of part of you know, whether you're directly involved in attaining a new client, um, you can just see the process of how it works and it's pretty good to see. That's a good question now. In the back, how did you guys decide what industry you wanted to work in? That is a good question. Um, so it's, it's interesting because I, you know we all live in Houston and work in Houston, and the majority of our market share is oil and gas. Um, but like I said earlier, I'm in entertainment. Um, we have real estate, real estate huge yeah. healthcare um, in Houston. It's not just oil and gas. And I think, you know, whether or not you want to stay in public accounting forever, whether you're using it as an avenue to get into industry, um, I think, you know, if you have a passion for just real estate in general, you know, that's maybe something that would drive your decision to request you know, a real estate client. Things that you want to learn about the business. So whether you stay or not, you know, you have a, uh, a lot better understanding of what goes on in that business. I mean, you probably ultimately know, you know, if you work on a client for a year or so, you're going to know more than, you know, I, I don't want to put a percentage on it, but more than half the employees that probably work for that company, because you're not just focused on one area, you're focused on the whole big picture, so it's, I think that. Yeah, and a lot of times, 
sometimes at these events, if you click really well with a senior manager, if you are a partner that's here, for example, Memphis, we have FedEx, and the lead partner for Memphis is an alumni for Ole Miss, and so he's here all the time, and a lot of Memphis people end up on FedEx because that partner meets them, they click, and he pulls them onto their engagement for their internship. So um, that's a good question to ask, too, what, what clients are the people you're talking to um, on, and then maybe that's something you want to do if you don't have a specific, I want to do oil and gas, and that's the end of it for me. Um, the people you're meeting can help you get there as well. So. Yeah, and, and I think I, I was super interested in how Live Nation made money, you know, because I didn't really fully understand. Ticket sales is a big part of it, but they have sponsorship contracts with artists, um, you know, they, they own venues, they put on a lot of, of different festivals. So part of that to me, um, of how they make money and how, you know, and all that stuff is pretty cool. It's a, it's a good point that when you're going through, you should just. Do a little background research on the city that you like and you know, find out what industries are there and what are the big companies. Because when you're going through, um, you know, as a younger staff going into public accounting, you have a lot more say, right? You say, hey, I'm coming in, I'm Phil, I really like the oil and gas industry, so introduce me to partners or managers or employees that, to Chelsea's point, work on like the oil and gas industry so that I can build my network, right? And so the more networking opportunities that you have, the more your name will be kind of brought up when it, when it comes to like a new client or if you wanted to get to a new industry. One more question? I was wondering if your board helps take a company public, like you want to buy shares of that, like free WF shares, or is that illegal? That's very illegal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> very illegal. I agree, had that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to your point, and, and this is, Think about this, and this is just kind of general business knowledge, right? When you're working on a private client, this is what it is. It's a company that's not on the New York Stock Exchange or whatever. You can't just go to a website and say, hey, private client, I want to buy a bunch of shares in your company. It's not like you can just go and say, you know, hey, Fidelity, here's $1,000. I want to buy shares in this private company. Not all companies are like that. You have to like, imply as like an investor. And they, I mean, I don't, it's different. Every company is different, but. Typically, they're not going to want someone. They're not going to sell you shares in a private company if you're just coming and bringing a thousand dollars. You know, they're looking for like private equity firms that are bringing two hundred fifty million dollars, and they're going to buy a chunk of their shares. So, to your point, yes, very illegal, um, but also very hard to do. Like, I would have to go and like find a private equity company and then give them money, and so it would be kind of like a lot of back work and. Honestly, it would just be harder than the amount of money I would make. And you have to disclose all your investments to the firm, and it's kind of a pain to submit all that. So, you know. <laughs> but no, I mean, good question. Like stuff like that, you just will never know unless you ask. Anything else? You'll learn about that in what audit to the independence section. Any other questions? No. Guess we're done. Yeah. Awesome. All right, well, on uh, behalf cool. of Fade Out the Thanks, Side man. and the Graduate School of Accountancy, I'm going to thank you for uh, stopping by and giving us some of your time. You guys are too kind. <laughs>